are concluding today a series, a little short four-week series through the book of Jonah. And uh, if you've been here, you know we did kind of a chapter a week. And uh, you can go ahead and turn there. Jonah chapter four, that's where we're gonna be. Swipe there, turn there. If you don't have a Bible, the words are gonna be on the screen here. And so you can follow along that way in just a second. Now, let me catch you up on where we've been. So Jonah's a prophet, and the little four-chapter book of Jonah is a a narrative about what God called him to do. God called him to go to this city called Nineveh to take uh, the good news there to preach. He didn't want to go, so he ran the opposite direction, boarded a boat, gets thrown overboard. Some of you know the story. If you've been to Sunday school, gets swallowed by a great fish, then spit up on dry land. Last week, we saw in chapter three, he ends up going to Nineveh, and in Nineveh preaches a very short sermon. Uh, It's eight words in English in Hebrew language, which most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Uh, It was five words. This guy preaches a five word sermon and what the Bible tells us in chapter three is the entire city turns to God and repents. The entire city, 120,000 people turn and repent. And so that gets us to chapter four. Now, what you would think after this incredible moment in chapter three where Jonah preaches, this dude says five words and the entire city repents and turns to God. Like for a preacher, like this is the pinnacle moment of his career. Like success as a prophet or a preacher is like what happens when you preach and the entire city turns and repents, right? And so this is like the, the, the preacher equivalent of a coach winning the Super Bowl or uh, a businessman landing the once in a lifetime multi-million dollar deal, you know, whatever it is pinnacle moment. I mean, if this is today, Jonah gets invited to to preach at all the conferences, to have all the book deals, like this is a pinnacle career moment for Jonah. So what you would expect in chapter four is you would expect like almost like a, a capstone for those kinds of things. Like, you know, Jonah is celebrating the life change that's occurred in chapter three, the whole city comes to faith. Or maybe you would expect, you know, he sets up disciple making systems to develop the people that have repented in chapter three that, you know, permeate the whole city. Or maybe even something a little different. Maybe like he, he meets the girl, he marries her and he rides off into the sunset they all live happily ever after like you expect something amazing like something really good to be the end of this little four chapter book the book of Jonah but what you get in chapter four is actually something that's not a happily ever after moment it's actually something very different than that and I want to show you what it is it's really interesting check it out the first word that you see in Jonah chapter four is but So all this cool stuff has happened, like revival in a sense, breaks out, this spiritual renewal, repentance, the whole city repents. But chapter four says, but, but Jonah was displeased, the Bible says. Jonah, it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry. Now, what's interesting about this is this word angry in the original language, it doesn't mean that he's just a little bit perturbed. In fact, it even says it in English, uh, it displeased him exceedingly. The word in Hebrew is the word, this is a little interesting to me, the word is ra'ah. It's almost an onomatopoeia word, like that sounds like what it's inferring. It's like, rah, like he's angry. Like it, the, the word in, in Hebrew means he burns with anger. He's so furious, which is so fascinating to me. And you actually, if you look throughout this chapter, you'll see the Bible say four more times in just this chapter how angry he was. In fact, two of those times, it says he's angry enough that he didn't even want to live. Like he's so angry, he says, God, just take me out now. So there's such this contrast between what's just happened and it should be a celebrative moment and then actually what you see Jonah doing and experiencing in chapter four. And it's such a contrast that I think what the biblical writer wants us to do is to ask the question, why in the world is Jonah so angry? And so that's the question that we're gonna ask today. And so to answer that question, I wanna introduce you to somebody that you just saw in Bridge News. This is my friend Taylor right here. That's Taylor. For some of you, he needs no introduction, uh, especially those of you in Columbia. A lot of the songs we sing in Bridge uh, worship and when we worship together, Taylor had a part in writing those. Great guy, was on staff here for a season and uh, still a great part of our church. Interesting thing about Taylor is Taylor loves to metal detect. I actually borrowed this little metal detector from him. This is called a pinpointer. 
Um, Taylor does it so much that he's kind of gained this reputation for he can find cool things. And so he was telling me the other day about all these cool things he's found. This particular lady right here called Taylor. Taylor brings, this is John. Taylor brings a little team with him. She, her husband had just passed away uh, not too long before this. And uh, she was so sad because she had lost his wedding ring. And I know you can't see that, but it's in the, in the picture there. And she wanted to find it. She was distraught because she told Taylor the wedding ring was worth probably about $15,000. But to her, it was worth way more than that. She said it was, it's a priceless treasure to me. And so she, through a mutual friend, reaches out to Taylor to come help her find this wedding ring that she thought was lost in the garden. And of course, you know the end of the story. They found it. They, they found the general area with these big metal detectors, and then they, they pinpointed it with this one. Now, what's interesting about metal detectors is I'm going to try to do this here with my microphone. Let's see if I can get it to beep. Is it going to beep? It's not going to beep. Of course, it's not going to do it right now. Maybe, ah, there we go. Did y'all hear that? There we go hear that? So what's interesting about metal detectors is the closer you get a metal detector to the treasure, the more intensely it beeps, right? The closer it gets to the treasure, the more intensely it beeps. And that's how they found this treasure to this lady. Listen, that's the exact same thing anger does in our life. Anger burns more intensely the closer it gets to what we treasure in our hearts. And so what you see with Jonah is you see anger burning very intensely. And so then you have to ask the question, what is it that Jonah is treasuring so much that it's causing him to burn with furious anger? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because that's what we're going to talk about today. Verse 2 of Jonah chapter 4, it says, And he, Jonah, prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That's why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you're a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. That's the word kesed in the Hebrew language. It means a covenant love or a saving love. Uh, you're abounding in steadfast love, God, and relenting from disaster. Now, what Jonah has just done in his prayer is he has quoted Exodus 34, which says that God is abounding in steadfast love, slow to anger, and he's merciful. And what Jonah is saying basically is, God, I knew your character. God, I knew that you're full of grace and that you're merciful and you're abounding in love. And I knew that if I went to Nineveh, that you would give them kessid, that you would save them. You would give them your saving love. He's saying, I didn't run away to Tarshish uh, because I was afraid of those barbaric uh, uh, Assyrians. I ran away to Tarshish because I knew that if I went and preached, you would do what you just did. You would give them grace. And God, basically Jonah's saying, and God, they don't deserve it. God, do you, do you know what these people do? God, do you know they, these people, these people rape, these people steal, these people skin people alive, these people worship idols. They don't deserve your grace. And really what Jonah's implying in this whole thing, and we see it kind of play out through the passage, is they don't deserve your grace, but I do. They don't deserve your grace. They deserve to suffer, Jonah would say. In fact, what you're seeing here is you're seeing, like so Jonah's got some nationalism that's bubbling up in his heart. He's got some racism that's bubbling up in his heart. Definitely, Jonah feels like he's superior to those people. That's bubbling up in his heart. And can I say, you know, he just quoted Exodus 34. Friends, it is possible to know the word of God and yet not have the heart of God. And that's what you see happening in Jonah's life. It's possible to know the word and yet not have the heart of God. And so what you see as we continue on is Jonah, he's not giving up hope that God may eventually pour out his wrath on these bad people, the um, Assyrians. And so in verse five, look, Jonah went out of the city and he sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he, uh, till he should see what would become of the city. So basically what he's just done is he's gone out away from those people and he set himself up like some bleachers almost so he could watch and eat his popcorn as a spectator watching God hopefully pour out his wrath um, on these people. Now look what verse six says. 
Now the Lord appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah so that it might shade, be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. So what's the discomfort that he's talking about? Well, remember, this is modern day Iraq in the middle of the blazing sun. So it's probably about 120 degrees there. Um, and I actually read a story as I was preparing for this about some soldiers who were deployed to Iraq and they talked about how excruciatingly hot that it was in that, that part of the world. And that like, they, they would sometimes even just pass out from the heat. And in fact, the, they said the only comfort they would get was when the rudders would engage and the propellers, the, the fans would come on on the helicopters. And they were like, oh, finally, a little relief from the scorching heat. So don't underestimate the level of discomfort that Jonah's experiencing. And then when God appoints this vine to grow up and become a shade over him, the level of comfort then that he experiences is intense. And the Bible wants you to know that. Now, what's interesting is all through the passage, you see Jonah angry. This is the only time in the passage that you see the Bible tell us Jonah was happy. In fact, it's the only time in the entire book of Jonah that you see that the Bible says that Jonah is happy. But sometimes when you study the Bible, you can learn more about what the Bible is trying to tell us from what it doesn't say than what it does say. Now notice in this passage, it says that Jonah is exceedingly happy, but here's what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that Jonah gave praise to the Lord, the giver of all good gifts, because he appointed this vine to grow up. No, he wasn't praising the Lord because of the thing the Lord had given him. He was just happy for the thing. And what the Bible is trying to tell us is that Jonah's treasure was Jonah. Jonah's treasure was himself. It was his own comfort. It was his own desires. It was what Jonah wanted. And Jonah was reigning supreme in Jonah's life. And in this passage, you see him happy when he does get his way. Exceedingly happy, the Bible says. And you see him exceedingly angry enough to die when he doesn't get his way. Jonah's supreme like focus was Jonah. In Bridge family, don't we all really know in our hearts that that's the gravitational pull of all of our hearts? To be so concerned and focused about us. In fact, um, Romans chapter one, Paul talks about this idea. He's talking to the Roman church and he says this. He says, uh, their foolish hearts were darkened. They, they sometimes worship the created thing more than the creator. That's exactly what you see Jonah doing here. His focus is Jonah. And many times my focus is Chris and many times your focus is you, is it not? The Jews during uh, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, their, one of their big celebrations, they had this really interesting tradition. They read all 47 verses of the book of Jonah, the four chapters, 47 verses. And then they pray and they do that so that they could remember the condition of their hearts, the gravitational pull, the propensity of their hearts to focus on themselves. And after they pray and after they read, they chant in unison, I am Jonah, I am Jonah, I am Jonah. And so Bruce the question I want us to ask here in Columbia Online, wherever you are, is are you Jonah? Has your heart drifted to a place of focus less on God's will for your life, less on God's plan for the world, less on God's glory, and more on my own comfort and my own desires and my own hopes and dreams. So if you ask that question, the Bible actually helps us answer it because what you see throughout this text is you see sort of some markers for a heart that has done that in Jonah's life. And so it becomes then for us a great diagnostic grid to go, hey, uh, do these things apply to my life? So as we go through the rest of this message and you'll see these markers, I want you to sort of filter your heart through it to help you answer the question, am I Jonah? So I wanna give you three things. If you write them down, here's the first one. It's right here. The first thing that we see in Jonah that's an indicator that his heart has drifted to a focus on him is we see a lackluster prayer life. A lackluster prayer life. In fact, we, we saw in verse two that Jonah has prayed, did we not? It says this in verse two. It says, and Jonah prayed to the Lord. 
But what's interesting about that is that this is only one of two times in the entire book of Jonah, the narrative of his, his life, that we see Jonah praying. Two, the only, this is one of two times. The other time is when he was in the belly of the fish. Why, why is that important? Well, the only two times this prophet of God who God had called to do this mission, to go preach, the only time we see him praying are times when he didn't get his way when he's in the belly of the fish and he's uncomfortable and he's scared and he says, God, please help me. The other time is right here in this passage when he didn't get his way, when God did something that he didn't like and, and he prays to God again. So basically what he's doing is he's treating God like this cosmic vending machine, <laughs> right? Like God, I don't have what I want. I'm gonna, God, let me bow on my knee and pray and punch in. Oh God, please give me this. You know, and then it fall, hopefully it falls out of the bottom, right? He's treating God like a cosmic vending machine. He's got a lackluster prayer life. And Bruce Fraley, let me ask you the question. How about you? Is your prayer life such that you're walking with God daily? You're spending time, the Bible says, pray without ceasing. Are you spending time just in constant conversation and relationship with God? Or is your prayer life more like, God, I want the promotion. God, please heal my loved one. Of course, of course, those moments of distress should drive us to go boldly before the throne of grace. But if that's all that our prayer life consists of, there are, listen, there are oceans of the abundant life in Christ and blessings that we're missing out on by not walking with God daily in a constant sort of state of prayer. What we see Jonah experiencing here is a lackluster prayer life. And it's an indicator that his heart, his heart has drifted away from God's glory to Jonah's glory, Jonah's hopes and dreams and desires. I remember about 12 years ago, I was pastoring a church on the other side of the city. And um, one Sunday morning, I was doing my final prep. And I always pray this before I preach. I always pray, God, help me to say today exactly what you want me to say Nothing more, nothing less. God, I trust you. You know, something like that. I pray that every time. And I remember sitting down in my final prep and I prayed that prayer and it hit me in that moment. This is the only time I've prayed throughout this entire sermon prep process was right before I walk on stage. And honestly, I was convicted in that moment because I realized that prayer was less about God's glory and it was more about me not making a fool of myself and being embarrassed on stage. God, help me not be embarrassed. Help me to say what you want me to say, not something stupid, right? That, that was really the posture of my heart. And I look back on that season of my life when my prayer life was lacking, and what were other descriptors of my life? Well, I was irritable a lot. <laughs> I would say things to my wife that she didn't deserve. I was focused on bolstering like what people thought of me more than what people thought of the Lord. I found my value in how my church was growing, not my value in who God says I am as a son of the king. See, because of my lackluster prayer life and my focus on myself like Jonah, there were oceans of God's blessing and grace and abundant life that I missed out on. So how about you? Do you have a lackluster prayer life? All right, that's the first one. Um, the second one is this. It's self-righteousness, self-righteousness. Um, what you see all the way throughout this book um, is, is a self-righteousness that Jonah uh, experiences and expresses. In fact, if you go all the way back to chapter one, which we talked about a few weeks ago, Corey did such a great job. What you see in verse nine is it says, Jonah says, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord this way. In other words, I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the seas and the dry land. As Jonah says it, you can almost feel his chest bow out. <laughs> like I'm a Hebrew, I worship the Lord this way. What, what he's saying basically is he's, he's basically saying, I'm morally superior than those Ninevites, those Assyrians. My worship is better than theirs. I'm good, they're bad. You see it all through the passage, all through the book of, of Jonah. I'm good, they're bad. I deserve God's grace. They don't deserve God's grace. It's a self-righteousness that bubbles up all throughout Jonah's story, especially right here in, um, in chapter four. Now, theologians tell us that this passage 
has a counterpart passage in the New Testament. In fact, there have been books written about this. A counterpart passage in the New Testament, it's in Luke chapter 15. Now, those of you who've been around Sunday school and church for years know that Luke 15 is the story of the prodigal son. Um, and just to refresh you, if you're new to church, the story of the prodigal son is a story of a, a father who has two sons, the younger son takes his inheritance early, goes away, squanders it on uh, living crazy and wild and on parties and women and the such. He finally loses everything he has and he finds himself on rock bottom eating the food that the pigs would eat and thinking like, that's satisfying to me. But he's so distraught, so distressed after squandering all of his blessings and his inheritance that he comes back to the father thinking the father is not gonna accept him as a son anymore. But you know the story, maybe he comes back to the father. And when the father sees him in the distance, the father runs to him, puts a, a coat on his back, puts a ring on his finger. The Bible says, kills the fattened calf for him, throws a party, welcoming the son back home. My son who was once dead is now alive, the Bible says. That's awesome. But what we often forget about in the story of the prodigal son is that there was another son in the story. There was an older son. And I wanna show you in Luke chapter 15, verse 28, what the older son says and how he responds to the younger rebellious son coming home and receiving grace. He says, the Bible says, but he was angry and refused to go in to the party. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you well. In other words, younger son was rebellious. I was not. He was bad. I was good. I've served you well. Uh, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. That's, I find that funny every time I read it. Uh, but then his son, this, this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes. And what did you do, father? You killed the fattened calf for him. You threw a party. You welcomed him home. He says, I've done all of the things right. My moral record, my performance is 10 out of 10. His is not. I've obeyed you the right way. He has not. I find that I'm able to say, to do enough good myself, Father, that should make you happy. He has not done that. And see, the reason that Jesus, who tells this story in Luke 15, puts the older brother in this story is because he wants us to know that there are two ways to stiff arm God. There are two ways to alienate God in our lives. There's the younger brother way, the Ninevite way, being rebellious, being bad, but there's also the older brother way. There's also the Jonah way and it's called self-righteousness thinking that I can do enough good stuff in myself to make God happy with me. And what does that automatically do in our lives? It makes, if we have that mentality, it makes us look at people who don't have that moral standard as those kinds of people. Exactly what Jonah is doing in this passage. So you see this self-righteousness bubbling up in Jonah in the passage. But listen, what God is looking for is not more good people. God is not looking for good people. God is looking for more broken people who've been made new by the gospel. Broken moral people and broken rebellious people whom the gospel has made new. So we see in Jonah's selfishness, in his focus on himself, a lackluster prayer life, that's a marker. We see a self-righteousness and a feeling of the ability to be good enough to make God happy with us, that's a marker. And the third thing is this, Jonah has also lost sight of God's mission. He's lost sight of God's mission. Look at verse uh, seven, back to Jonah chapter four. It says, but when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm. Remember God appointed. I'm gonna come back to that at the end of the message. God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it's better for me just to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do. I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant 
By the way, every time I see that, I think, <laughs> y'all are way ahead of me. I pity the fool every time. Now, those of you who are under 40 have no idea what I'm talking about right now. I pity the plant. <laughs> For, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in the night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there uh, are more than 120,000 persons who do know, I can't even read, who do not know their right hand from their left hand? And then he throws in this weird line about cattle with a question mark at the end. And I'm gonna come back to the question mark in just a second. Now, what Jonah, what God has just said to Jonah is, Jonah, your life is completely out of order. Jonah, you're worried about a plant, angry enough to die over a plant. And Jonah, you're worried about this plant. I'm worried about the 120,000 people in Nineveh who need to repent and be discipled. Jonah loves himself and his comfort more than the 120,000 people being reconciled to God. He's lost sight of the mission of God in the world. There's a book that has been really influential to me and I know maybe many of you, uh, about 20 years ago, I read this book called The Purpose Driven Life. And the very first line in that book says, life is not about you. And this is exactly what Jonah, uh, what God is saying to Jonah. Jonah, you've lost sight of my mission in the world and you've turned a focus on me and my mission back to yourself and you're focusing on you. And so let me just remind you real quick what God's mission in the world is. Sin entered the world in Genesis chapter three. God created it perfect. It's beautiful, it's amazing. Genesis 3, sin enters the world. Right after sin comes into the world, God breaks on the scene and God preaches what theologians call the proto-evangelion, the first gospel. I love this so much. God himself preaches the first gospel. It's in Genesis 3, 15. And it says, God, I, God will put enmity between you. He's talking to the enemy and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He, important, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So what God is saying is sin has entered the world. It's fractured everything, the world, the condition of the human heart, everything. But God says, but I'm going to fix it. And I'm going to send an offspring to fix it. And it says here, a he offspring to fix it. And what he's going to do is he's going to bruise his heel. In other words, he's going to injure himself. But in his injuring of himself, he's going to bruise your head. In other words, in his injuring of himself, he is going to crush you. And in crushing you, he's going to fix ultimately everything that was broken in the world and in our hearts when sin entered the world. This is God foretelling his son Jesus coming to go to the cross to fix it all. God preaching the proto-evangelion on the first gospel. Fast forward all the way to the New Testament. Jesus comes. And in John chapter 20, Jesus says, just as the Father sent me, I am sending you. And you and you and you and you and me. God is sending us to also preach the good news of Jesus everywhere our feet take us. But so often our hearts become like Jonah's, don't they? And we get so focused on us and our comforts and our desires and our dreams that we forget the mission of God in the world. And people pass by every day who may spend eternity separated from God. While we pursue our 401ks, climbing the corporate ladder, having fun, watching the game. Oh, those are all great things, good gifts. But man, don't our hearts often so focus and idolize those things that we forsake the mission of God in the world? Um, when I was in high school, there was this guy uh, who was a, a good friend of mine really since about fifth grade. His name's Al, Al Bibbs. And uh, Al like, was known in our school to like, he was the incredible athlete. He was, I mean, he could dunk in eighth grade, like two hand dunk. He, he was incredible. He was the fastest player on our uh, football team. You always wanted to get out of the ball if you needed a few yards. You know, he was the guy, uh, you know, he, he was the man. I mean, he, he was having pro scouts, uh, major league scouts come watch him play baseball at like 16. Incredible athlete. 
And uh, I remember exactly where I was when I heard something about Al. Uh, I was standing in line at Burger King, about to order my food. And this guy who I also knew was standing next to me. And he says, uh, have you heard about Al? I was like, oh, what? I was expecting like, you know, he got drafted, you know, to play pro baseball or he's, you know, playing D1 football or basketball or whatever it might be. Um, and he said, uh, do you heard about Al? And I was like, no, what? And he said, Al died last night. What? He said, yeah. He said he got in a fight and, and he got stabbed and, and he, they rushed him to the hospital, but he didn't make it. He died. And it was hard for me, you know, like as a high, I mean, at this point, a college, young college student to like process what had happened. It was the first one of my friends that something like this had happened to. But a few days later, I remember being, this was a season of my life where God was really working on my heart. And I remember a few days later sitting and processing and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit convicted my heart so much. Chris, how many opportunities have you had to share Jesus with Al and you never did. You were so focused on whatever the thing was, playing high school sports or having fun as a teenager, or what, which, which we all do those things, right? But I was so convicted that I had all these opportunities to share with my friend Al the message and the good news of Jesus. And to this day, however many years later, it's been a long time. I don't know where Al spends eternity. I don't know. And how many people, Bridge family in our lives, walk by every single day? We have the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with, but like Jonah, we've become so self-consumed that we've forgotten the mission of God in the world. And so guys, filter your heart through these grids. Filter your heart. Do you have a lackluster prayer life? Vending machine mentality? Have you forgotten the mission of God in the world? Have you become self-righteous? Thinking I'm good enough, but really walking with the Lord is like non-existent in your life. You're just doing the stuff to try to make God happy because it's what you're supposed to do. If so, those are indicators that your heart has drifted into an I am Jonah mentality. I'm focused on me. I'm my treasure. Now, do you remember this, in, in the passage, it, it ends with this weird question. There's something about cattle, but it ends with a question mark. All through this chapter, you see God ask Jonah several questions. And then the entire book of Jonah ends with a question mark. Why? It's because God wants us to ask ourselves, am I Jonah? Am I Jonah? Have I focused more on myself than God's story and God's mission in the world and God's grace and God's desires for my life? Do you remember, I told you to, to remember the word appointed, God appointed. God appointed the fish back in chapter two. God uh, appointed um, the Ninevites to know him in chapter three. God appointed the vine. God appointed the worm to devour the vine. God appointed the scorching wind. God did all of these things to make Jonah comfortable and uncomfortable, comfortable and uncomfortable, so that it would reveal the posture of his heart, so that it would, it, God was almost appointing Jonah to run his heart through this diagnostic grid. To go, Jonah, where, where's your heart? Where's your heart? God has appointed these moments in Bridge Family. Maybe God has appointed this moment right now for you. Maybe you're a follower of Jesus and you'd say, you know what? I'm kind of like the Ninevites in that, and I've done some stuff. I'm kind of like the younger son in that I was once with the father, but now I've run away. God's appointed this moment for you to turn and come back. No matter how far you've run away, whether you're a follower of Jesus and you've run away or whether you're not a follower of Jesus, you're here kicking the tires of church and, and you've, you've never run away. You've never been with God. You've just been doing your own thing, just rebellious, kind of living your own way. Listen, it, you might've run away. You might be a million steps away from the father. It is one step back. And the, the story of the book of Jonah is a story of God's 
bottomless grace for the rebellious, like the Ninevites, like maybe you, and for the religious, the self-righteous, the self-focused, like Jonah. It's a story of God's bottomless grace, no matter where you find your heart today. And so maybe you're here, you don't know the Lord. In just a few minutes, um, we're, we're gonna sing, we're gonna worship, we're gonna take communion, do some things. But at the end of the service, there's gonna be a prayer team up front. And if that's you and you go, man, I'm Jonah. And, and I need to repent. I need to turn back to God. The prayer team will be here, come talk to them. Our staff will be back at the um, living room. You can go talk to some staff back there. Just say, I, man, I, 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 here's what I want you to say. I'm Jonah. If you're watching online, just put in the chat, I'm Jonah. A prayer team will connect with you on there, okay? So turn back, run back to the arms of the Father and experience God's bottomless grace. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us on our YouTube channel today. I hope that you felt the welcome home of Christ right through your screen. Here we believe that the gospel is good news worth sharing. So if you'd like to share this stream with your friends and family, you can also subscribe to this channel and you can use at BridgeChurchTN. Also, if you'd like to give, there's a link in the description there you can click and it'll walk you through all the steps. And if you'd like to stay connected with us, you can simply head on over to bridge.tv. Hope to see you again soon.